Hello, my name is Mary Rose Forsyth. I'm a nurse practitioner and I'm also the program director of Maytech, Michigan, which is housed in the School of Medicine at Wayne State University. Today, I'm going to talk about guidelines for Michigan clinicians that are intended to prevent HIV transmission. The first is around non-occupational HIV post-exposure prophylaxis for those who may be at risk. And the second is testing and reporting guidelines uh, for HIV, syphilis, and hep hepatitis B virus in the perinatal period. So first we'll start with the guidelines for HIV non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. You're probably familiar with post-exposure prophylaxis in the healthcare setting or for first responders. The guidelines I'm going to talk to you about today um, are available for people who are exposed outside of their workplace. So what is HIV NPEP? HIV non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis, it's a preventive treatment strategy that can reduce the possibility of acquiring HIV infection in a person who's experienced a high-risk exposure. Who's a candidate for HIV NPEP? HIV NPEP is appropriate for individuals following risk from a source known to be HIV infected or whose HIV status is unknown related to receptive and insertive vaginal or anal intercourse, needle sharing, and injuries such as needle sticks with a hollow bore needle, human bites, accidents with exposure to blood or other potentially infected fluids. Accessing NPEP. Since a person who has experienced a non-occupational exposure to HIV may present in any healthcare setting at any time, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, in line with the U.S. Public Health Service, recommends that institutions, including emergency departments, urgent care facilities, clinics, abuse shelters, health departments, develop clear protocols for providing NPEP. So what are effective NPEP protocols? Institutional NPEP protocols should include a formal expert consultation mechanism, such as in-house infectious disease consultant or access to a PEP line. The protocol should also include patient education components, uh, such as handouts or maybe uh, short videos. Um, it should also include access to baseline HIV testing, access to starter packs of a recommended HIV NPEP regimen, and also a process to ensure patients have prompt access to the full 28-day supply of NPEP medications. These protocols should also have a system for follow-up testing and a mechanism to facilitate linkage to follow-up evaluation by either an HIV specialist or another qualified physician. I'm going to talk about HIV NPEP following exposures not related to sexual assault. Why provide HIV NPEP? NPEP offers the possibility of preventing HIV transmission when potential exposure to HIV has already occurred. Situations that may prompt a request for non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis include condom slippage or breakage or lapse in use by serodiscordant partners, uh, those are partners where one person has HIV and the other does not. Um, another uh, situation might be needle sharing or other episodic exposure to body or blood fluids. Evaluating candidates for NPEP. Baseline HIV testing should be performed for every person seeking NPEP. You need to know what the person's status is before you pro uh, provide NPEP in order to um, exclude the possibility that they've been infected at some time previously and were unaware of it. If possible, HIV status should also be confirmed in the source. Um, I personally think that that can be difficult because the source may not be willing to come forward. If the HIV status of the source is unknown and the risk associated with the exposure is substantial, NPEP is recommended. Testing for sexually transmitted infection should also be obtained for all persons seeking NPEP following sexual exposures. 
Um, in our clinics, we test all orifices just to be sure that um, this STI testing is adequate and complete. So when is NPEP appropriate? First off, the timing and frequency of exposure need to be considered. NPEP is intended and should be used for infrequent, unexpected exposures, and it should begin within 72 hours of an exposure. Optimally, NPEP should begin within two hours after exposure, but up until 72 hours, so three days after the exposure, it is appropriate to offer NPEP. Here's just a scheme, a schematic, that shows um, how to decide um, whether or not a person is a candidate for NPEP. So how do you prescribe it? A 28-day course of combination antiretroviral therapy is recommended following non-occupational exposure to blood, genital secretions, or other potentially infected body fluids when the exposed person seeks care within 72 hours of exposure. And as I said before, the sooner NPEP is initiated after the exposure, the more likely it is to interrupt HIV transmission. What, do you, what factors do you need to consider? Um, we actually have two treatments. Um, recommended are either dolutegravir and Truvada or Isentris and Truvada. What's the difference? Truvada is a once-a-day medication. So is dolutegravir. So the dolutegravir Truvada regimen requires two pills once a day. Isentris is a two times a day medication. So if you choose the second option, they'll take two pills once a day and then a, a single Isentris a second time. A lot of institutions are still using Truvada and Isentris because it's, Isentris is a little more easily available at pharmacies. But it's up to your institution to decide which of these you prefer. Another thing to consider, is the patient insured or uninsured? Um, there is a mechanism uh, to get uninsured patients' medication. The drug companies are often um, available to help pay for the 28 days of medicine. If the patient is insured with a high copay, they also offer copay support. The idea is that NPEP should not be a financial burden to anyone. The other thing that you need to consider is you need some effective interagency collaboration. For instance, the ER, the pharmacy, the pharmaceutical in industries, patient assistance programs, and follow-up agencies all need to be engaged to be sure that NPEP is working for the patient. Pre-treatment counseling for NPEP should include counseling about potential associated side effects, Luckily, both of the regimens I discussed before, either dolutegravir and Truvada or Isentris and Truvada, have very, very few side effects. Some patients may experience a little fatigue and a bit of nausea for a day or two, but generally they're side effect free. You also need to talk to the patient about adherence to the treatment plan. This isn't something you should stop and start and then start and stop again. Uh, once started, they need to try to take these medications every day for the full 28 days. And then they need follow-up testing. Um, we need to be sure that they understand where that can happen, whether you want it done at your institution or if you want to have them followed up at their primary care doctor. Those are the kinds of things that the institution needs to decide. Follow-up testing should happen at four to six weeks, 12 weeks, and six months out. Um, you can assure the patient that a negative HIV test resulted 12 weeks reasonably excludes HIV infection related to that exposure. So what are some special considerations for patients receiving NPEP? Patients who are prescribed NPEP benefit enormously from ongoing support related to their treatment, including starter packs of medication to help ensure treatment adherence until they can access their full 28-day supply. That five to seven days that you give them in a baggie to take with them helps ensure that they can find a pharmacy, figure out how to pay for things, get over the exposure uh, so that their mental state is perhaps a little um, quieter and that they feel that they can get out and get their meds. Another thing that benefits them a lot is assistance with Copay and other pharmaceutical company financial support programs. Uh, Truvada is made by Gilead. Icentris is made by Merck. 
and Diutegra Vera is made by Vive. And all three of those companies are very generous in financial support uh, for NPEP. And their programs are easy to access. Another thing patients need is expert follow-up consultation. They need reassurance that this um, treatment method called NPEP has been used with healthcare providers for years and has shown benefit and that they um, should rely on it and that they should do what people have asked them to do to ensure that they don't experience an infection as a result of their exposure. They need adherence counseling, they need access to the follow-up testing and care, and then they need some HIV prevention counseling, especially if they are engaging in risks that may make um, these exposures more likely. So what about these patients at recurring risk for HIV? Should they be getting NPEP or should they be getting another prevention tool called pre-exposure prophylaxis? Remember, NPEP should only be used for infrequent exposures. So after completing the 28-day NPEP regimen, we should be offering PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis to people who present with repeated high-risk behavior or for repeat courses of NPEP. That way they can take Truvada every day in advance of exposures, and PrEP has been shown to be highly effective in preventing transmission. I want to also talk today about HIV NPEP for survivors of sexual assault because they're kind of a separate and need a little bit extra assistance group of people um, who may have had this kind of exposure to HIV. In August of 2013, the Association of Nurses in AIDS Care, the International Association of Forensic Nurses, the National Alliance to End Sexual Violence and the National Sexual Violence Resource Center released a policy statement recommending that systems be established to ensure that survivors of sexual assault have universal access to medications to prevent HIV following rape. And they were quite clear, and I personally in Michigan believe this to be true, in too many communities, access to these medications is lacking or inconsistent. These four highly regarded organizations recommend that healthcare providers treating sexual assault patients include HIV risk assessment and potential prophylaxis as a standard component of the medical forensic examination. They also recommend that anti-HIV medications be available where and when patients prevent after sexual assault. They recommend that people who've been sexually assaulted not be expected to carry the financial burden for HIV NPEP, and that people who've been sexually assaulted have access to advocacy and support services before, during, and after HIV testing and NPEP provision. Why offer HIV NPEP following sexual assault? HIV can be transmitted through mucous membrane exposure to infected semen or blood during sexual assault. Risk is parallel to occupational exposure through mucous membrane contact. Exposure risk, of course, depends on viral load in the ejaculate or blood and the nature of the exposure. Trauma and the presence of another sexually transmitted disease enhance HIV transmission. Reproductive tract infection is strongly associated with susceptibility to HIV, and risk is increased significantly with both microscopic or macroscopic trauma to skin or mucosal tissue. So when is HIV NPEP indicated post-assault? Tissue damage, including microscopic abrasions or the presence of blood at the site of the assault with or without visible physical injury, is an indication for NPEP. Studies have shown that genital trauma occurs in nearly two-thirds of rape survivors. Anal trauma occurs in slightly over half of survivors. Often women who have been anally assaulted also show manifestations of genital trauma. So it's important to note that the absence of visible wounds or abrasions does not indicate that physical trauma is not present. Recommending NPEP post-assault. Clinicians should recommend HIV NPEP to survivors of sexual assault when exposure to HIV may have occurred as defined by direct contact of the vagina, anus, or mouth with the semen or blood of the alleged assailant 
with or without physical injury, tissue damage, or presence of blood at the site of the assault. HIV should also be offered in cases when mucous membranes or broken skin of the survivor have been in contact with blood or semen of the alleged assailant. HIV NPEP should be offered as soon as possible after exposure and initiated ideally within two hours and generally no later than 72 hours following exposure. Counseling the assault survivor. Considering the survivor's emotional state and ability to comprehend the nature of antiretroviral treatment, recommendation for HIV NPEP should be communicated to the patient simply and clearly. Discussion regarding initiation of HIV NPEP should include a brief, simple explanation of the risk of acquiring HIV infection during the assault, proven potential of NPEP to prevent HIV infection, possible side effects of the NPEP regimen, which as I said earlier in this uh, presentation are virtually negligible now, the duration of NPEP, that's 28 days, the importance of adherence to the medication regimen, the plan for accessing the full 28 day supply of appropriate ARVs promptly, and the monitoring schedule, including recommended follow-ups. Serologic screening. The healthcare provider should obtain blood from the sexual assault survivor for baseline HIV rapid or expedited point-of-care serologic testing when recommending NPEP. The provider who obtains baseline HIV testing, just as in any other situation when a person um, orders HIV testing, that provider retains responsibility for ensuring the result is communicated face-to-face -to, -face to the sexual assault survivor. In this instance, though, as in others, this responsibility may and generally is delegated to the partner services or to the clinician who's providing the follow-up care. So when and what to start? HIV NPEP should be started without waiting for the results of that baseline HIV test, and refusal to undergo baseline HIV testing should not preclude initiation of NPEP. The preferred NPEP regimens are Icentris and Truvada daily for 28 days or Dalutegravir and Truvada daily for 28 days. Alternative agents may be used in the presence of drug intolerance or toxicity. If the sexual assault survivor is too distraught to engage in a discussion about the drug regimen or to make a decision about whether to initiate treatment at that initial assessment, the clinician should offer a first dose of medication. Remember, this is time sensitive. After 72 hours, we can't offer NPEP anymore. So if the assault survivor is upset and really not understanding too well what you're saying, offer the first dose. And then schedule a follow-up appointment within 24 hours to talk about the indications for HIV NPEP and all of the other things that need to be understood by the patient. Um, and try to schedule that, give them a chance to go home and, and get cleaned up, feel better, and then come back for this teaching about what NPEP can do for them. Starter packs are super important. Starter packs of recommended ARV medication should be available on site for rapid initiation of NPEP and to ensure daily adherence to treatment following sexual assault. These starter packs are supposed to contain a five to seven day supply of antiretroviral medication to cover a patient until he or she can obtain a prescription or access compassionate use medications through the pharmaceutical manufacturers for the rest of the 28 day regimen. Following up, arrangements should be made to ensure that the patient is evaluated promptly by an HIV specialist or other qualified clinician who will Discuss the reasons behind the decision to treat with the patient. Reinforce why NPEP is important for them to take. Evaluate initial drug tolerability. Check to be sure that they haven't been having side effects that wouldn't be expected with these drugs. Ensure access to a 28-day supply of antiretroviral medication. Reinforce the need for adherence to the NPEP regimen. And then arrange for appropriate follow-up care and monitoring. If prophylaxis is initiated and the alleged assailant is subsequently found to be HIV negative, NPEP should be discontinued. 
So making the clinical decision. The clinician's decision to recommend HIV NPEP should not be influenced by the geographic location of the assault or any prior relationship between the victim and the perpetrator. The decision to recommend HIV NPEP should be based solely on the nature of the exposure during the assault, the readiness of the survivor to initiate and adhere to the regimen, and the HIV status of the alleged assailant if it's known. Now what about in pregnancy? This is an especially important time for a patient to be referred to an HIV expert. Um, most pregnant women will get NPEP, and it's up to that HIV expert clinician to decide whether Truvada and Dalutegravir, Truvada and Isentris, or some other drug combination is best for this pregnant woman. Here are some references in case you want to read a little more deeply about the thinking behind offering HIV NPEP to all survivors of sexual assault. I'd like to talk also about Michigan guidelines for HIV, syphilis, and HPV in pregnancy. HIV, syphilis, HPV in pregnancy, Michigan's testing and reporting guidelines. In Michigan, all pregnant women should be evaluated for HIV, syphilis, and HPV as soon as possible in pregnancy as part of their routine prenatal care. Testing should occur at the initial prenatal visit or with the diagnosis of pregnancy at any health care facility, including emergency rooms, primary care offices, and urgent care centers. All pregnant women in Michigan should be tested again at 26 to 28 weeks gestation for syphilis and HIV. This routinized testing of all women eliminates a burden on the provider to make a judgment about whether this patient is at risk for these infections or not. It's also in line with best practices nationally, and it moves Michigan towards its goal of zero perinatal HIV transmission, which we haven't been able to reach um, many years. We've had two or three transmissions that could have been prevented, especially if the second routine test at 26 to 28 weeks had been offered. All these pregnant women, then, need to be offered these routine prenatal tests regardless of any perceived risk or previous pre-pregnancy testing results. On the other hand, all pregnant women who engage in behaviors that put them at increased risk for infection or women who present in labor with no available documented record of appropriate testing need a third test. Women should be tested, again, for HIV, syphilis, and HPV using a rapid or expedited test at 36 weeks gestation or at the onset of labor, regardless of previous negative test results. Um, we encourage this rapid testing at 36 weeks or on labor and delivery because we need to get those results back promptly so that treatment can be initiated immediately. The sooner and the better that we can get the viral load suppressed, the less likely it is that that baby will acquire HIV during the birth. And so expedited testing, STAT, a rapid test, and most times treatment will be initiated based on that rapid test, not waiting for confirmation of the test, but we'll initiate it based on the rapid or expedited screening test because it's so important to get that viral load suppressed as rapidly as possible. Testing infants and children. HIV testing is also recommended for all infants and children whose biological mothers have not been tested appropriately during their pregnancy. No infant in particular should leave the hospital without a syphilis serology on the mother. Um, it's important also to consider uh, children whose exposure is unknown and who may be in foster care or who may be adopted directly from the hospital. Um, the person legally authorized to provide consent should be informed that rapid HIV testing and syphilis testing is recommended for infants whose biological mothers have not been tested, and those tests should be done. Remember, informed consent is required for both maternal and for newborn HIV testing in Michigan. So documentation. 
According to Michigan law and guidelines, testing, refusal to test, refusal to accept treatment, descriptions of any required perinatal tests that were not performed for any reason should be documented in both the mother's and the baby's medical records, along with the dates of testing, refusal, and the dates and results of any ordered tests. Um, I'd like to talk about each of these transmittable diseases and pregnancy in order to underscore the need to follow the HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis B testing guidelines. HIV transmission from mother to child during pregnancy, labor and delivery, or breastfeeding is known as perinatal transmission. Perinatal transmission is the most common route of HIV infection in children. Each year, six to 7,000 HIV-positive women deliver a baby in the United States, and happily fewer than 200 HIV-infected infants are born in the U.S. each year. Um, this is because we have a means to prevent perinatal transmission, and that's why we need to have women tested early in pregnancy so that we can identify those who need to become uh, uninfectious by taking antiretroviral medications during their pregnancies so that their babies don't become infected. 40% of HIV-infected infants in this country are born to women who don't even know their HIV status. While preventing HIV infection in women is the best way to prevent perinatal transmission, treatment is available to prevent transmission from an HIV-positive mother to her baby. With good medical care and antiretroviral therapy, HIV-infected parents become significantly infectious to their partners and live long, healthy lives. We want to offer HIV testing twice to all pregnant women in Michigan. Why? We need to identify pregnant women who are positive for HIV and start them on antiretroviral treatment as soon as possible. Antiretroviral medications given to the mother during pregnancy protect the infant by reducing the amount of virus in the mother's blood. Antiretroviral therapy decreases the infant's exposure to the virus in the uterus. By crossing the placenta, Antiretroviral therapy provides the infant with both pre- and post-exposure prophylaxis. We want to protect the infant by reducing the mother's genital viral load. Antiretroviral therapy decreases the infant's exposure in the birth canal. Antiretroviral medication should be prescribed and continued for the entire pregnancy, regardless of the mother's viral load and or CD4 cell count. Combination antiretroviral treatment, or CART, should be started as soon as HIV is diagnosed during pregnancy. Data demonstrate an association between earlier viral suppression and significantly lower risk of transmission. The choice of regimen should include current adult treatment guidelines into consideration. It should include what is known about the use of specific drugs in pregnancy. And we can be assured and feel confident because recent data indicate no clear association between first trimester exposure to any antiretroviral drug and increased risk of birth defects. Women on CART prior to pregnancy should continue this lifelong antiretroviral therapy after delivery. Labor delivery and postpartum. Continue HIV antiretroviral therapy during labor and delivery. AZT should be added intravenously if maternal viral load is greater than 1,000. The antiretroviral drug regimen a woman is receiving should be taken into consideration when treating postpartum bleeding resulting from uterine atony. Avoid methargen in women who are taking a protease inhibitor. If methargen is used, administer the lowest effective dose for the shortest possible duration to help avoid and prevent side effects or drug interactions between the protease inhibitor and the methargen. In women who are taking nevirapine, efavirenz, or atravirine, additional uterotonic agents may be needed. So the bottom line here is to be careful if there's postpartum bleeding, perhaps consult with ID, and make sure that methargen is the proper agent to use. 
HIV-positive women should continue antiretroviral treatment postpartum for their own health and to prevent transmission. So, vaginal or cesarean delivery. HIV-infected pregnant women should make a delivery plan with their physician or midwife in advance of their delivery. The risk of HIV transmission is low, and vaginal delivery is possible for women who take anti-HIV medications during pregnancy and have achieved a viral load less than 1,000 near the time of delivery. A scheduled cesarean section is recommended, however, for infe HIV-infected women who have not taken anti-HIV medications during pregnancy, whose viral load is greater than 1,000 near the time of delivery, if they have an unknown viral load near the time of delivery, or if the mother wants a cesarean delivery. Some women feel that that is safer for their babies, even though research has shown it probably isn't. However, we respect their request because we want them to feel safe during the delivery time. Okay, what about antiretroviral therapy for the newborn? A four to six weeks AZT prophylaxis regimen is recommended for all HIV exposed neonates to reduce perinatal transmission of HIV. So this means for mothers who have been on antiretroviral treatment and whose virus has been suppressed, their infants still get a four to six week uh, prophylaxis regimen of AZT. Infants at higher risk of HIV, however, should receive multi-drug prophylaxis, generally with AZT given for the full six weeks, combined with three doses of nevirapine in the first week of life. Some experts even recommend triple antiretroviral prophylaxis for infants at higher risk of acquisition. The best idea is to consult promptly with a pediatric HIV specialist. It's actually best to consult with their pediatric HIV specialist before the delivery so that plans can be made, medications can be obtained, and that infant can be handled properly after birth. Now let's talk about syphilis in pregnancy. Diagnosing syphilis. Syphilis is hard to diagnose. It's frequently referred to as the great imitator because it can be misdiagnosed because it looks like other diseases. Syphilis is spread through direct contact with an infectious lesion during oral, vaginal, or anal sex. It can be passed in pregnancy from a mother to her unborn baby, and these babies may die before or shortly after birth. They may become developmentally delayed, and they may have seizures and other defects that show up later in life. Syphilis is a serious, serious thing to have in pregnancy. What are the symptoms of syphilis? Signs and symptoms of syphilis vary by the stage of the disease. That's why it's sometimes so hard to diagnose and is called the great imitator. During the primary stage, the length of time from infection to the presence of the first symptom ranges from about 10 to 90 days. The norm is about three weeks. A single lesion, called a chancre, appears on the body at the place where the bacterium entered. Um, the chancre is small, firm, round, painless, and usually lasts for three to six weeks. There can be more than one chancre. Each place where the bacterium entered uh, the body will be a chancre. Secondary stage. A rough red rash that does not itch is typically found on the palms and on the soles of the feet, generally as the chancre is disappearing or after the chancre has gone. This rash may be faint and hard to detect, and it can appear on other parts of the body. Notice the picture that I've included of a syphilis rash. Rash may, be, uh, may appear and it can disappear and come back again. Usually, the rashes end by the end of the first year of infection. Other symptoms that the patient may have include fever, swollen lymph glands, headaches, fatigue, muscle aches, weight loss, and there may be patchy hair loss. After the first year, patients enter into late stage. There are no external symptoms, and these, the, the patient goes along like this for years and years. Damage, however, is, in, is occurring to internal organs, and this damage eventually leads to paralysis, dementia, blindness, numbness, lack of coordination, and death. It's important to realize that since there are no external lesions in the late stage, 
Syphilis is rarely transmitted in this stage. The big exception is mother-to-child transmission in utero. So diagnosing syphilis. Um, diagnosing syphilis requires two kinds of tests. Um, one is if you can get fluid from a lesion, you can do dark field microscopy, and that is kind of like the gold standard for diagnosing syphilis. Most people, though, get blood tests. They get a, they get a non-trepanomal test and they get a trepanomal test. Um, the common non-trepanomal test is the VDRL or the RPR. And the levels of these tests correlate with disease activity. So they rise and fall in accordance with how the disease is. This is a good test for um, following how a patient's treatment is, is working. As the RPR or VDRL falls, that indicates that the patient's treatment for syphilis is working. The trepanomal test actually measures antibody directed against T. pallidum, and that means that it's actually looking for syphilis. It correlates poorly with d disease activity because you're measuring antibodies that may remain with a person for life, and so this test may remain reactive for life. So you can see why we need both tests, one to confirm infection and one to see if the infection at the point of the test is been controlled or not. What is the treatment for syphilis? The preferred treatment for all stages of syphilis is benzathine penicillin G. Primary, secondary, and early syphilis, that is syphilis that is less than a year in duration, um, people get 2.4 million units IM once. If someone has latent syphilis or late syphilis, syphilis that they've had for more than a year, they need 2.4 million units IM once every week for three weeks. If a person is HIV negative and has asymptomatic neurosyphilis, they get 2.4 million units IM once a week for three weeks, and they also get aqueous benzoyl penicillin G or procaine penicillin G, 9 million units IM in doses of 600,000 units over 15 days. Symptomatic neurosyphilis or asymptomatic neurosyphilis in an HIV positive person, these folks get 2.4 million units IV every four hours. Alternatively, continuously for 10 to 14 days, and they may have added oral penicillin to supplement levels. They also get procaine pen penicillin G at 2.4 million units per day intramuscularly, plus probenicid at 500 milligrams orally four times per day for 10 to 14 days. Now, what does this mean for our pregnant women? They need this treatment. They should be treated with penicillin, even if they are allergic to it. Um, pregnant women who are allergic to penicillin should be desensitized and treated with penicillin. Why? Because we know it works. And we're treating a pregnant woman not only for her own health, but also for the health of her unborn child. All right, let's move on to hepatitis B in pregnancy. Testing for Hep B in pregnancy. Uh, the guidelines call for all pregnant women to be tested as soon as possible in the first trimester as part of routine care. And that, again, can be during the initial prenatal visit or during diagnosis of pregnancy at any health care facility. An infectious disease specialist and a pediatric infectious disease specialist should be consulted promptly upon confirmation of a positive test result. Pregnant women assessed to be at high risk for HPV infection should be retested in the third trimester. And the risks for infection include things like a sexually transmitted infection during pregnancy, injection drug use, a partner who injects drugs, a partner who has had sexual contact with a man, um, an HP surface antigen positive household member or sex partner, a new or more than one partner in uh, recent times, especially during the pregnancy. Uh, pregnant women who present to labor and delivery or emergency departments with no available documented test results should be tested STAT. So how is hepatitis B transmitted? Hepatitis B can be transmitted when blood, semen, or other body fluids from a person with the virus enter the body of somebody who's not infected. 
The virus is very infectious and it passes easily through breaks in the skin or across mucous membranes in the nose, mouth, anus, genitalia, urethra, and eyes. Hepatitis B can be spread through sex with an infected person. Transmitted, transmission occurs through direct contact with blood from an infected person, even in amounts too small to see. What about hepatitis B in newborns? Hepatitis B virus can be transmitted from mother to baby during vaginal delivery or C-section. Without prompt prophylaxis after birth, as many as 90% of newborns infected with hepatitis B develop lifelong chronic infection. One in four infants with chronic hepatitis B will ultimately die from chronic liver disease. Treating hepatitis B in the newborn. Infants born to hepatitis B surface antigen positive mothers should begin treatment as soon as possible after delivery, optimally within the first 12 hours with hepatitis B immune globulin and their first hepatitis B vaccine dose. These exposed infants re receive their two subsequent doses of hepatitis B vaccine at one month and again at six months of age. Infants should be tested for hepatitis B surface antigen and antibodies at 12 to 15 months of age to monitor the final success or failure of therapy. Mothers with hepatitis B can be encouraged to breastfeed their infants. You can access the guidelines that inform this slide presentation um, at any of these uh, websites. They're all very good. I've included our own at the bottom just because they're all located in one site there and we update them at least weekly. You can also access expert assistance either through the Michigan HIV Consultation Program, which provides um, answers to questions within 24 to 48 hours if you um, go to that uh, link, or if you have urgent questions, you can call their 24-hour consultation line. The same is true for us at Maytech Michigan. Um, urgent questions include things like, oh, we have a mother in labor, it's two in the morning, we don't know what to do exactly, um, can somebody help us? Don't hesitate to call uh, because it's very, very crucial that we address each of these illnesses in a pregnant woman as fast as we can, and hopefully prior to the baby being born. 